do, do artists have a um, responsibility to be doing something? Like, what, is, what are we supposed to be doing? What's the role of art in, during a pandemic? Artists are used to uh, crisis. Their life is always in crisis. So uh, this is not so much different. Uh, it, it gives us some uh, material. <laughs> um, and um, of course, there's an economic uh, perspective that is uh, very difficult for us. Uh, but this is also same thing. <laughs> it's always difficult. I mean, I'm like a pig in shit a little bit. I'm quite enjoying being able to just do whatever I want and be an artist full time. I like that. Yeah. Um, and I couldn't exist without it. I'm glad I've got it. I don't know what I'd do if I wasn't creative. I just would be so depressed if I couldn't make or be creative in some way or like I'd be so depressed I don't know I wouldn't be able to deal with it so even though it is stressful I you know what's my alternative like one thing that I got a bit annoyed with was this um was this idea which was being sort of spread about on social media and people were talking about it uh was this idea that people should be super super productive during lockdown, that you should, even if you're not working, you should imagine that you're always working. Well, a lot of it, after having COVID, um, the greater part of a month was just recovering from that. So I had, you know, some of the symptoms that I had were um, really intense uh, fatigue, uh, chest tightness, difficulty breathing. It wasn't, uh, it wasn't like, you know, I was just trying to get uh, through the thing, you know? Uh, and so it wasn't a climate that I felt particularly creative or that I wanted to get involved in making. What happened straight away was that it really made you realise to what extent a large portion of your life was about rushing around, yeah. you know, going to meetings completely unnecessarily, actually, as it turns out. I do feel that uh, there's, a sort, there's sort of like, there's so much noise in, in general, there's so much noise and then the lockdown, a lot of that noise went away because you didn't have to commute to work and yeah. just everything quietened down for a bit and you could kind of focus on what was important. Um, so I'm kind of not necessarily looking forward to us going back to how it was because it's quite nice. It's quite nice. I personally, yeah. I mean, I know this is a privileged position, but it's quite nice being uh, stuck in my house. Um, the answer is very interested in being about now, you know, the hyper now, the very on the now, the... Yeah ahead of the curve um but i'm sorry you know if you're not dealing and looking at the social issues right now then you know you're going to be forgotten about you might look like you're about the, the cutting edge but actually you know history has a funny thing of leaving a lot of people behind so i think a lot of artists and a lot look will look like um you know it's just completely blind and in its own little hole and and really who was it speaking to and it won't be talked about mm. or remembered you know because it's not pertinent yeah uh, to this present or the future even yeah uh, i don't know i mean the thing is i mean i would say that what happens in this situation like this is that the existence of different art worlds within this art world become exposed so the precarity i know this is like a thing that i'm banging on about but the idea of like precarious labor as being so central to the way the whole thing operates that becomes exposed when something like this happens because there are people who can't survive outside of when that machine stops so i would hope well what i would hope would change is and I hope generally changes is is a greater realization of the uh, of the fact of that kind of structural inequality within the way the art world works. I also think that's just broader. I was going to say that's just broad. Uh, that's yeah. broader. That's also you know that's the world generally. You know the art world's very big and it's a very big ecosystem, and of course the mistake is to assume it's a singular entity, mm. and that you know when you talk about the art world, well, is there such a thing? Yeah. It's just a version of the world in a particular set of interests or zone. You know, I, I, when I first moved to, to Germany in 2009, it wasn't that long after the GFC, and there were a lot of people who were kind of like, 
oh, you know, oh, like, yeah, it's rough, but, you know, we'll kind of cope. And, you know, it's only rich people who are going to be affected because, you know, we're all poor anyway, right, blah, blah, blah. And then you sort of realize that the only thing about trickle-down economics that's true is that the hardship trickles down. You know, it would be naive to think this is the end of capitalism, for sure. It's like it, it, it has spectacular ability to, to recoup things, whether it's co-opting Black Lives Matter or, you know, figuring out ways. I mean, it was, it was so interesting with the whole kind of um, TV advertising thing, you know, that, that when, the, when, the, when the crisis first sort of happened, mm there was that slight hiatus and then you started to see quite quickly them all inventing new advertising streams which directly responded to um to people's fears around coronavirus and how they, they were responding and how you could shop online and and all the rest of it and it, it is that ability to to just recoup any challenge out there to, to just bring it back within the logic of capital where there is this kind of hope for some sort of you know, political and economic change. But I think that like any glimmer of hope I did maybe feel about that got completely quashed also by how fast things have felt like they've gone back to normal here. Yeah. You know, it's, it's, um, and how quickly people forget. Uh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, beyond even just conversations around, you know, dialogue shifting towards, you know, uh, racial injustices and things, but just, you know, cause we're basically reopened here mm. and, and the way that people are kind of moving in the world and are like going about their lives, it's, it's kind of amazing how quickly it snapped back. And I don't think our cultural memory is strong enough to have any of that stuff change. I mean, I've, I've heard people talking about, um, about, uh, creating an equivalent of what happened in the 1930s in America, you know, when they, when they produced the, uh, the New Deal, Roosevelt's New Deal, where they got, under the Works Progress Administration, they got artists employed, you know, they had, well, not, just art, not just visual artists, also filmmakers and playwrights and everything, you know, employed to do public works, a kind of idea of the public value of the arts, I guess. So, so that's when you get like loads of murals being painted in America in post offices, and you get loads of uh, productions of, and radio drama and stuff. And, it, and people have talked about that idea of sort of as in, as in that's a new paradigm of like utility of art and that sort of public utility. And it may be that that, because that came out of the Great Depression. So it's sort of like a way of getting people back to work again and also creating like a public good for the arts. That's, that's a possible thing. Is it, is it Richard Wolff who says, the economist, American economist, who says that it wasn't really one new deal, but rather lots of new deals, multiple small deals, which they all tried out and see, to see what would work out. And so in the end, it became a sort of a bundle of new deals of which some things worked and some didn't. So it's definitely, um, I think, governments need room for experimentation to take a chance on things and projects. Um, I think this, you know, I think this government seems, and I think Tories tend to sort of have this blind spot where they're not actually comf uh, confident of the public or the crowd. Um, they're not aware or convinced of the skills that people have and the talents. Um, so, so my thoughts are really actually, you know, how do you, you know, because people are proud and they do want to contribute. Mm -hmm. They want to be active in mending or improving and getting the country back onto the road, uh, um, on the road. So. The real question is, what can people do? What are the jobs, the tasks? Um, what's the word? You know, you know, social service they can they can do. You know, while being on unemployment benefit or in in some version of of you know income from the government. And I think people will be keen to step up and do that. And so that's the real question. Various workers, we we're not going to have any work for a long time. Um, you know, wherever you work, like I do a lot of community engagement work. Hmm. So my bread and butter is being paid to do projects. Often where I make my own work, I get paid to make my own work, work with community groups on a long-term basis. Um, you know, so I'm with people, I'm out and about in the community doing stuff. What's interesting to me about a lot of the questions that you hear sort of like say people 
on the smaller end of the art scale or in, in any kind of smaller independent less commercially viable enterprise yeah. is that the questions they're asking themselves now aren't necessarily that different to the questions they were asking themselves six months ago <laughs> it's just that the it's more important now than ever to finally figure those out so then you kind of need to go well, what are the what are the traps that we were falling into six months ago that we kind of can't allow ourselves to fall into anymore like we what are the things that we were sort of being slightly self-indulgent about or slightly um, willing to let go that now are just like, hey, we have no time for this shit anymore. Now we have to really think about, you know, how we kind of move forward and how we, um, how we try to protect ourselves. Because, I mean, really, it's going to be us, right? Smaller, smaller institutions are going to have to protect themselves. There's not going to be huge amounts of money coming down. Even the most willing public and audience are going to have to be careful because everyone's um income has taken a hit possibly the time now is for a more sort of socially engaged art to flourish because how can a gallery based art flourish in a time when we can't go to a gallery uh so it's kind of it's like a just a refocusing like i'm not saying that a new mm. art could emerge just saying that the the spotlight might move towards an art a different sort of art which is potentially a good thing as far as my, when I think about the history of social, socially engaged work or social practice, especially in Britain, is that it flourished most within a neoliberal economic regime in which like, um, and in, in an economic boom as well, in which there could, what was weird about social practice was that at a very low level, i.e. with artists with no name, like me, you could get them in to do a project and you could measure the impact. So models of evaluation and uh, kind of funding for socially socially engaged ways of working kind of like proceeded as the um, kind of economic theory of neoliberalism became dominant, especially, I guess, in the boom years of the early 2000s. That's a really good point anyway, because I hadn't actually considered uh, that, yeah, it, it, is, it is potentially a great time for community-focused art, but at the same time, Community focused art is heavily reliant on funding, and if the funding disappears, are people can people do it for free? And whether, yeah, whether the economic model that provides that opportunity will carry on providing that opportunity for that art to happen, or whether, yeah, it can only really happen if driven by individual artists and driven by communities who want that art to happen. That's I really don't know. That's all up for debate, and it, I guess it's down to down to us as the people who want that stuff to carry on happening to we've got kind of waiting to see mm. where funding moves to i mean that there was already a direction of travel towards the link between arts and health and well-being and mental health you know and that's and, and indeed kind of climate change mm. is whether or not that trajectory continues or that becomes more prevalent because coming out of this there is a perceived need to work even harder to make sure that communities that have been you know suffered the worst impacts of everything that's been happening mm. um have the same kind of cultural opportunities as all of the people who were already going to galleries theaters and all the rest of it so i think that's why it's really interesting that everything funding wise is is kind of on pause it's been in a sort of rescue mode so we, we thank goodness as the East Leeds project we're really lucky to get some of the Arts Council emergency funding and we have support from uh, Leeds 2023 as well so that's great that's you know for, for six months that's kind of stabilized us to a certain extent but by the autumn we really then need to be looking at what are the what are the funding opportunities um, so yeah I think whether or not the new or kind of refocused funding streams are more oriented towards community possibly that's that's a direction that it, it could go in but there's this perceived need i think you know if you're arts council and you've got all of those really big institutions in the national portfolio mm. and the people that they employ the artists and technicians and the supply chains and all of that stuff you know it's kind of as the cultural flagships so to speak how do you how do you make those decisions i mean they're not 
enviable decisions to have to make, are they, about who can be saved? Um, obviously, there's a lot of lobbying of um, the culture minister, of um, um, uh, the treasurer and stuff, um, to say, say, you know, this is what the arts does to this country. And it's quite London-centric, to be honest. Um, but, you know, I was trying to imagine, like, you know, if, um, if everything collapsed on the South Bank Centre, you know, it'd be like <laughs> empty South Bank Centre, empty National Theatre, empty Globe Theatre, empty Tate Modern. You know, that's just like be a cultural desert, you know. Um, and, you know, some of the, of course, the government's not going to allow that because, no. well, we haven't got tourists, but, you know, they are, um, you know, what uh, London is to culture, what, the sun is to Spain, you know, or something like that. Um, I don't know if the Tories know that, though. <laughs> <laughs> it reminds me of the um, 80s again, you know, when in Liverpool Street, it's just like, it was de deserted, you know, on a sort of mm. Saturday or uh, Sunday. Mm. Uh, but there'd be all these kind of amazing warehouses where someone might just, you know, kind of have a club night or something, or mm. a site-specific art project, you know, um, and, you know, kind of walk into these cavernous spaces and, you know, people would have um, exhibitions, you know, performances, music, um, you know, kind of almost like a real idea of the original happenings and stuff of um, I mean, it'll, York, it'll, 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 it, that will need a real then. sea change in attitudes from the arts, mm. though, because with something I fight against, the pro problem is I'm very conflicted because mm. I like a good, nice socialist country that pays every artist a li uh, living. That's not this country. Um, but so I like that. On the other hand, I, I get very frustrated in this country of people saying, I'm only going to do this cultural thing if the Arts Council pays me to do it. Uh, I think, well, that means your, your cultural life is, is dictated and decreed by the state. It's not, you don't call yourself independent, you're not independent, you're, you're instrumentalized by the state. Both, I occupy both those positions. I think it would be amazing if we all got a, like a universal basic income to be creative beings. At the same time, I want total independence from the state and from anybody, <laughs> anything and everything to, and I think that, that if you do, can do that, you have more power because you're not beholden to yeah. it. So. I, I agree, I think, um, you know, when you when you speak to a generation of British artists that might have, um, uh, when when it wasn't universal credit, you know, but it was um, the, the UB40 and you sign on every two weeks and the job seekers um, um, uh, allowance. Um, and everyone's, you know, I used to, I remember when I used to interview artists um, who might have been making work in the 80s and, and uh, early 90s, and they just said, um, it was the doll. The doll was my kind of grant, you know, it, but it gave me freedom because you didn't have to have this pressure of, you know, that you need to show evidence of, you know, yeah. how many jobs you've applied for and so forth. I'm not saying that we should completely rely on state money mm -hmm. and welfare, but um, as you said, some kind of basic allowance where you're not going to be harassed, you know, that you are recognised as an artist or you're recognised as a, as a writer or something like that. Um, the, the, the amount of money that there will be that the Arts Council will have to hand out will be reduced hugely so so but that doesn't mean that it won't be a fairer distribution so that that is a possibility I can see that happening I mean yeah I think that the the issue with all the other economic stuff is that things like universal basic income for example they have like a utopian version and then they have like a kind of hard anti-government version so universal basic income lots of right-wing theorists use it to, to to theorize how you might abolish the state and abolish healthcare and stuff so if there is universal basic income you could just you could guess that we would probably go for that version rather than the nice version in which like there's still state you know funded healthcare and stuff like that i think because the government's performed so badly in comparison to europe and in comparison to other countries around the world, I think there's going to be a real question, at least, about Tory governance, because, you know, it will come out that the reasons why it, there's attitudes which are embedded in, in, in conservative attitudes and uh, um, as, to, as to the disregard for safety um, and the sense that the public is it was treated like cannon fodder. Um, I also think that there'll be very large questions about the Anglo-Saxon market attitudes or policies and philosophies. 
because those are the economies and the countries that have done the least well. Mm. And there's questions asked to can you tie the poor performance regarding public health and, and controlling COVID uh, to, you know, an inability to act in time because you were too frightened of the markets? You know, did you want too many things at the same time? And so, you know, the question was, was it people first or markets first? Yeah. So I, I guess that puts me back into um, just campaigning and fighting again, doesn't it? Mm. Which we've never stopped doing. But I would probably say um, up until, say, last year, I'd say maybe from 2016 to maybe 2019, people's energies campaign as activists were maybe swallowed more by the kind of Corbyn movement within the Labour Party. Right, yeah. you know, people were still think doing things grassroots, yeah. but that's kind of got sucked into sort of trying to get um, a socialist government elected. Mm. And now we know we're going to have this government for at least another four years. So it's what do we do? We need to kind of, we need to regroup, we need to reorganize, we need to work within the communities. Mm. As an artist, you know, you're going to do that to be able to get funding, to get paid somehow. So I feel like it's going to change from the bottom in the sense that um, artists are resourceful. You know, you look to sort of see what the opportunities are um, because travel's going to change. I don't think people are going to be traveling up and down the country doing, you know, projects and exhibitions. I haven't left my local area, which is, you know, three, three miles circumference uh for three months because there's no way i'm getting on a tube so we're some yeah. um, hyper local sort of uh, dwellers aren't we yeah no i think that and i think that is something that will will support i mean yeah you'll end up with rather than everyone flocking to these major retail streets mm. um or going out of town you will potentially what you find is people staying local not maybe not even buying local but experience but yeah socializing locally and what that what's the what are the infrastructure that the high street can offer to support that i mean, I mean I get, I, I, like the, I've, I've been totally unconvinced by the proposals to like bring back the pubs for example no this yeah. idea that we're gonna like return to like what return to like a pub and there'll be social distancing in place and there'll be, and then there'll, there'll be these kind of perspex screens. And yeah. it's just, people aren't gonna, I, I don't see it. I think what's gonna happen is people are gonna, and I think what's already starting to happen is that people are gonna entertain in their home more. Hmm. They're gonna bring the pub to the home, yeah. which I guess ties in with some of the artists live work activities yeah. of kind of using the domestic space as a space of kind of hosting mm. encounters that, 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 that transgress the kind of public private binary. I think in terms of the live work aspect, I think um, people are increasingly working from home, domestic lives are becoming workspaces and there's this blurring that I guess for artist-led housing, they kind of opted into it. It was a way of kind of developing a socially engaged practice in which kind of being a neighbor and being resident, being an artist and being an activist might all kind of blur into one by providing space in which to both live and work creatively. And I think for a lot of people, not out of choice or kind of opting into it as a kind of practice-based decision, uh, there are these overlaps between domestic life and work mm. and i think that's also revealing new kind of inequalities as well so uh, i've it's been interesting to see how a lockdown has uh, almost like kickstarted a kind of new wave of thinking about common land and access to green space and things like that mm. which very much ties in with discussions about the commons but mm. almost kind of reframes it in terms of kind of a lockdown scenario or, or a scenario in which living and working are blurred um, I think people are going to work much more locally 
literally on the doorstep. So they're mm. going to be working locally and they're going to be working more with our community, whatever that is, whether it's businesses or whether it's local authority. Um, and, there's, and that's a good thing because that kind of builds that strong sense of community, doesn't it? I think we've been thinking about... Um, also about like, you know, some of the travel stuff too. I mean, we're hoping, we're hoping to have like a really solid international presence at the fair. I mean, it'll depend on who is applying, what applications come in and how they kind of fit together. Um, but you know, I think we're, we're hoping for some sort of 50, 50 ish split and, um, would like to kind of have a real diversity, but you know, who knows what the border situations are going to be in a year. Um, who knows what people's kind of willingness to travel is going to be. And then it's also just like larger questions around travel and environmental sustainability, financial sustainability, and also like how inclusive we can be with, because of, and in spite of travel logistics, right? So it's, it's, it's some, I feel like we're, we're grappling with some of these issues in a larger sense right now. And I think we're bracing ourselves. But I also think that like, I think that we can be more optimistic here maybe mm. than uh, like if we were based in England or something because, because Denmark has reopened so much already. Yeah. And, and it doesn't seem unfeasible that, uh, you know, we will be able to have this, the, the fair in, at the scale and in the kind of um, configuration that we've been planning. I think that a lot of the, some of the restrictions that come out of Corona can just lead to like shifts that can be really interesting in their own right. Like if it ends up being, uh, uh, you know, a forced kind of localization or a regional focus. Mm. I could also see a situation where it's really interesting to just showcase and celebrate all of the different kinds of artist run activities that are happening throughout central or even just Jutland in general in this part of the country. I'm just thinking about the next few months, we're sort of not quite picturing, you know, as a whole, you know, what will happen towards the end of the year. You know, people talking about, well, what might happen in the high summer, August, September, holiday-wise, travel-wise, when the, when the uh, uh, you know, the assistance from the government ends or not. Um, so the question really becomes what happens, you know, the end of this year and what happens the year after? Mm -hmm. You know, will, you know, uh, uh, unemployment go up? So we're roughly around about 9% at the moment. Um, it could double. So that could be almost one in five persons unemployed. So I think it's really a question of how do people in civil society facilitate themselves and, and, and come up with ideas and things to do. But again, is that question of, you know, people need money, you know, to do things. Mm. Can government be, uh, for the time being, a kind of, you know, employer uh, for instruction, infrastructure and so on? So I think that's, uh, that's the question. And I, you know, but I think something does have to give with universal credit. You know, if they've made it really easy now for people to clean, they've got rid of the minimum income floor, what they need to do now is up it because there's going to be a lot of people self-employed, um, unemployed. At the minute, I mean, I've, I've been doing a lot of work with members around universal credit and the self-employed and some people being given the Arts Council grant of two and a half grand and... Mm -hmm you know, it, it negates the whole universal credit claim and it's trying to explain to the this, this system, which it's not set up to listen to the argument of, yes, but this is a business. This isn't going to go into paying this person's rent. It's paying the studio rent. We were saying how um, some people were in the mindset that, oh, I feel like things will change a lot after all of this. And mm -hmm. I was saying how I feel that it won't, that it mm -hmm. will just go straight back to how it was. Um, because... I don't know it's it's just how things are I guess people yeah. are eager to get back I mean the people who have the positions of privilege are eager to just get back to how their life was yeah. and the people who don't have the power obviously don't have the power to change it permanently yeah. and I think it's a similar thing with this and I want it to you know I think we all want it to change for real and not just change no, make those tiny little steps in the burst of energy 
to actually make people make long-term changes. Yes. I guess the government logic or the government conversation is, is about when we get back to normal. Mm. Whereas there's a whole other conversation, which is about we shouldn't ever be thinking about going back to what the old normal was and, and the opportunities to, to think differently and, and do things differently. And with artist led practice, it's kind of like we've experienced a lot of good with it. But I think now we're getting to a point where it's getting tough. And I know through COVID in, you know, everything that's going to come after this, it's going to make it really hard. So we're just thinking about that a lot. You know, don't get me wrong. Like we've actually been doing really well over the like pretty well over the lockdown because we've had time to actually more time to invest into it. And ultimately, that's all we need. Yeah. We need to have time to be able to dedicate to lots of different projects and to give our time to like talk to people and do interviews and put our work out there and like sending off proposals and things like that takes time. Mm. And if you have time, that's great. You know, yeah. we could always use more money, but like, you know, we'll figure it out. I think there's an expectation now from members that they want to work differently. And over the past few months, I'd say since March, maybe February, March, we only had our first face-to-face -face meeting. A group of some members, a working group, have been um, developing a good practice charter because we don't really have collective agreements with employers and organisations because of the, the way we work. Equity would, maybe musicians union would because they've got um, orchestras and sort of performance companies. So for us, it's slightly different. So the good practice chart is like a set of principles that we want employers to sign up to. So these principles could be simple things like um, having to work as vice, which means, you know, recognizing trade union. It could be um, pay, you know, um, being paid properly, but also having contracts, you know, breaking it down bit by bit. Health and well-being. There's lots of kind of mental health issues for our artists who are working to deadlines. Mm. Um, social responsibility and health and safety is one of the ones I'm looking at. So we've kind of divided these up and everyone's gone away and done a bit of research and we've started to look at organisations we can talk to. Like we want a different relationship with the, the organisations that we work with, like the big NPOs, you know, the National Portfolio Organisations, mm. you know, because they're going to suffer in terms of if they rely a lot on income, which is... Um, come through you know cafes restaurants yeah. shops you know other things so they're gonna have to sort of jig rejig what they do so it's good in, in that sense because it means that artists will have something they can sign up to so if they see an organization that sort of works with it they'll think all right that's good so i expect them to basically meet these basic standards mm -hmm. and it'll help the union deal with less firefighting so members contact the union i've got this issue they get passed on to whatever exec member or me we deal with it and then the same issue comes up a few months later all right oh god that, that's just a crap contract why did you sign that <laughs> oh well that's what they gave us well you know you can negotiate so we know long term we need to do a lot of training around contracts copyright and we'll use the good practice chart as, as a starting point I mean, I think any venue that relies on, you know, a logic of footfall, whether that's theatre and dance and music, where it's about t ticket sales and bums on seats, mm. or galleries where, you know, it, it is dependent. I mean, a space like the Tetley, which is about numbers of people not only coming to see exhibitions, but bar, restaurant, you know, yeah. corporate eventing, all of that stuff that is, that is part of that package. That's under huge pressure right now. If you're not selling art, then what you're getting when you have a show is people coming and people noticing you in the sort of an economy of attention. And it's more about the collectivity and, and coming together and meeting your friends and so on. How are galleries going to function in the next year? Well, we were always sceptical of how we functioned then anyway or how whether we should function we, we function by default um the new york state governor hasn't cleared uh non-essential businesses to open i believe it's supposed to happen in four phases yeah. um phase two is retail and we are a retail establishment um mm -hmm. we're not they they're 
calling the arts or culture, I mean, I think that's more of a designation for like theaters and, and there are other um, concert venues. They have other considerations in terms of spe spacing and seating. And so we're looking for when the gallery can reopen um, legally and safely. I mean, obviously we have plans in place to like limit the number of people that are in the gallery at one time, mm -hmm. um, face masks being required. Um, We've thought about having a schedule where you can book a 10 or 15 minute block of time to have the space to yourself, like, and just, you know, yeah. have a system in place where we can preserve that, that space as a space to engage directly with the artwork, but then also not compromise your safety by having too many people around you. So yeah. thinking about being alone, but together and connecting it with socially engaged art. Because I think, I mean, I mean before lockdown, I'd, I'd, I'd heard the phrase being together alone in terms of like listening to electronic music, right. where you're like stood with other people, but your experience and thinking and like experience of listening to the music, although it's washing over all of you, your, indiv your experience is a kind of an individual one. Mm. And I guess it's you in opposition to like rock music and the mosh pit where people's bodies are literally kind of crashing into one another and people are sharing sweat and you know and it's very like you're share and you're and you're also shouting the same lyrics in, yeah. in harmony and all those sorts of things and i think socially engaged art has had a tendency towards focusing on that kind of that latter that kind of mosh pit model of socially social engagement mm. Um, and I think there's something really important about that, important about kind of sharing space with other people and physically being, sharing experiences with people mm. in a physical way. But I also wonder whether there's an opportunity to think about being public space and being together, but also being alone and experiencing things in a, in a different way. But there, there is the the convention of it, right, which is just, you know, the artists have time and the social space. And we're also trying to think of ways that we can honor that convention going forward. But there, there are, there is a function to that opening night thing that goes beyond the sales. And we're always happy when we have sales. And sometimes there is enough buzz or enough interest in that they feed each other. And so yes. that, that interest and that energy can drive sales, which is or always yes to that. Yeah. Um, uh, but then additionally, this other area, I mean, you know this, that it's about contacts and it's about uh, yeah. community and about sharing and, you know, interfacing with not just the artwork, especially if it's crowded, then, you know, so then if it's too crowded to really engage in a meaningful way with the art, you are in getting, engaging in meaningful ways with each other. And so we'd like to, like at our space, we'd like to honor, try to find a way and we're sort of brainstorming nick and i um brainstorming ways that we as as the owners of the space can can still hold a space for that type of interaction yeah. where maybe it's more like a longer term where that crunch that two hour crunch shoulder to shoulder mm -hmm. is maybe taken and drawn out uh, over a longer period so maybe it's less um of that frenzy but more of a of a sustained kind of interaction after interaction. Yes, we want, you know, butts and seats or whatever. <laughs> like we want, like, we want to have, we want to, to attract as large of an audience as logistically, physically as possible, given whatever restrictions are in place at the time, if any. But I mean, uh, equally as important to us is, is this internal program professional development opportunities or, or you know, co learning from each other that can take place behind the scenes. Um, and like connecting uh, the spaces with some visiting curators and things like that. So we really want the fair to have a, an impact on the artists who are participating and for them to feel like they're coming away with it, like with something meaningful that they can hmm. take with them further in their spaces. Yeah. and. That I think is less dependent on, That's true. you know, yeah. some of this, this, you know, less jeopardized, I guess, by potential social distancing or whatever. And so, you know, if we can kind of feel like we've achieved some measure of success in that way, we'll be really, 
really really happy even if you know we can only let like two people in at a time or whether we're only allowed a certain amount of people that can even visit it it's better that than um it just being completely digital because it's nice to have a real show and it's nice to get to speak to people in person and to see real artwork especially for the works that are sculptures and things that don't really you can have a beautiful photo of something but it's not really the same whether we should continue or not is another thing but i don't see i don't see uh i don't see an alternative i certainly don't see an alternative through the medium of the media like this i certainly don't see art i see no i can think of no art that truly exists in this medium i don't think people have found this medium whatever you want to call it this 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 virtual mm. this irreality i don't know uh, it's we're and we're, we're kind of lip syncing our way through this this thing Mm. And and what will come out of it, I don't know. I have no idea. I'd love something new to come out of it, but but yeah, I think it depends if you view the internet as a landscape where you can create art, or if it's just a sort of a presentation place where you go look at well, the painting I made, buy it. Well, it's 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 always gosh, it's always been a presentation thing, hasn't it? And and that's what's always depressed me. It's like a, a kind of bully. Um, you know, art is a particular thing where people do want to see it you know physically so it suffers yeah. from not from the digital or, or you know to what extent can you actually see it digitally um so that's an interesting question i would think perhaps what a lot of people might have not thought of is actually how weak or how the digital doesn't replace you know people want to see people face to face a lot of the art world is to do with the theater to do with the flesh you know being there being with people so i think people forget that actually you know art really is about some kind of form of social cohesion social contract and i think that gets really forgotten about i'm doing all these online seminars for open school east and that is flourishing in a really nice way in the sense that um normally i do i'll do i've done lots of these things for different institutions across europe or whatever but often they'll be for very tiny audiences and then the recording just kind of gets lost on SoundCloud or whatever. Mm. But because everyone has to do everything online right now, there's this kind of community forming up around the seminars, which is really actively engaged, which I, to be honest, I just haven't really had that before. Or people are really turning up to live streams. Like live streaming, I love the internet. I spend all my day, well, most of my days on a computer. Mm. But I've never watched a live stream in my life until now. It's the first time I've actually sat and watched. I used to joke, actually, I do these podcasts of interviews with artists. And I used to joke that I was the only person who ever watched a Vimeo video right to the end. Because I'd like go through people's Vimeos and watch all their back catalogue. But now, like, well, I, don't know if, I don't know if this is true, but I'm definitely actually engaging with art on the internet in a way that I don't think I really have, even though I've made art for the internet before. This whole digital rush, you know, to move everything online. It's great for some people it's really not great for others and i think you know there are artists and organizations like ours really who who feel under this huge pressure mm. to suddenly be devising digital content all the time and moving everything online that's really really problematic for us it's problematic for a lot of artists and i think you know there's some value in just sitting it out for a while and just waiting to see how things are unfolding because it feels like that whole digital space has got super competitive yeah. super quickly but i do consider the things that i do that are basically in discourse like a part of my art practice but they just happen to yeah as you say they happen to lend themselves quite well to existing on the internet whereas yeah maybe a big i'm doing these big drawings right now and people keep asking me what size they are because they, they could be a4 but they're actually two meters long and that kind of situation is where you realize that you need physical presence for something well yeah I, I the cliche is well it can't go back to normal and you hope that that's that's true because you, there's all sorts of things you don't want to you know that the skies are clear the the air is mm. easier to breathe it's a it's a it's beautiful out there um out there um 
but I suspect most most things will go back to normal. There's a, all the all the, the crisis now in, in for instance in theatres where the, all the headlines saying theatres are going to collapse, the National Theatre is in danger. All sorts. Of, you sort of wonder how that. I mean, it's always been in danger. Yeah. For one thing, like the NHS has always been in jeopardy. Mm. Um, but you wonder what country can allow the National Theatre or the NHS huh, to, to disappear? Well, but then a, that's a, that's a ridiculous it, question because they already have. Well, that's a great you know. thing, isn't it? Because it's forcing people to, um, to um, sort of re-examine what they think is worth funding. The idea that these things can be uh, commercially sustainable is, was always a joke and clearly now is an impossibility. It's a sense that we are all in this together, for, mm. for, for once, that actually makes sense to people. You know, yeah. so, you know, when things happen at government level where people can see they're just lying through their teeth, mm. there is that sense of them and us. Yeah. But unfortunately, what it also does is it feels like it disempowers people and makes people have little faith in the democratic political system we've got, this parliamentary system that we've got. The, the magazine that I'm doing that at the moment was going to be about the commons. It was always going to be about the commons. And then the pandemic happened. And then I was kind of thinking, well, the sort of the structural idea of commons like parks and libraries and those sort of things mm. being sort of like a, a manifestation of collectivism and this idea of, of the community mm. working together or saying this is what should exist and it doesn't need to be a sort of commercially sustainable thing. It's for the benefit of society. So, yeah. um, and suddenly that's really uh, important. It's really brought it into focus because, you know, they were, they were threatening to close down parks or um, yeah. the idea of sort of the individual against the collective, isn't it? Um, I, I think what was going to have to, what will have to happen is that, and there, there is already a kind of movement towards this, but the high street will have to be seen as a space that's not just for buying stuff. Mm. Mm. And I think the question then is what what gets <coughs> or given space mm. in 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 response to that. And I, I mean, there are lots of movements towards like community-led high streets or the idea of kind of combining community land trusts, which is mm. a kind of model for collective land ownership. Um, where, where does that intersect with socially engaged? art i guess the model is going to have to change uh, well rather than art being used as a kind of a front for supporting mm. a kind of commercial practice mm. i think it would be nicer if they were if, i think there's not going to be this back end for the artist for the artistic practice to to be a front to mm. so i think the 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 whole the whole mod, the whole model needs to change mm. I and I think art, artists can play a much more of a reproduct, like a productive role in that, rather than just a kind of uh, a surface level intervention. Quality and fairness um, are the kind of key things for uh, that. I hope the majority of everyone you know believes in. I think we all just agree to that. We all want a sense of fairness, and if that's a starting point, and equality, um, then let's look at how we can you know um, implement fairness and equality. Uh, life is unequal. Um, the, the system and the structures are unequal, and there'll yeah. be some that get through, um, and many that don't. Um, so, yeah, the kind of solution is: how do you make it more equitable, as you said, and, and fairer for? I'm in, I'm enjoying myself, and my my internet connection is un unstable. But then my connection with the real world has always been unstable. So there's very little difference. I did say to Leah when when uh, you emailed me about talking about this that I was like I was I was quite excited too because I feel like there is um, sort of in discussions we've had about you know sluice and some of the things that you do there's this idea of not kind of not falling into the trap of optimism or whatever. There's you know. <laughs> I'm going to hide the self view thing because it's so distracting when you see yourself. Isn't it? I'm trying to hide it. It wasn't let me hide it. Well, this is not going to go in your video. <laughs> Uh, this I'm is the only bit. This is the only bit that's going in the video. Well, I know, but I, yeah, I, but I do feel like it. Mm, no, I don't know. The problem is that history is written by the evaluators, and the, rather than the artists, isn't it? Because what you get is, um, yeah, what you get is the document that tells you 
how many people it helped rather than the experience of the artwork, which might have been a series of long, quite strange conversations or 